gospel according to St. Matthew, the fourth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was banished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against the stone. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the inspirations of our hearts be acceptable unto you, O Lord. Amen. <coughs> A few years ago, the Harry S. Truman Library in Independence, Missouri, made public 1,300 recently discovered letters that the late president had written his wife, Bess, over the course of half a century. President Truman had a lifelong rule of writing to his wife every day that they were apart. He followed this rule whenever he was away on official business and whenever Bess left Washington to go back home to visit her family in Independence. Scholars are now examining the letters of all of this in, for new light that this might throw on the American political and diplomatic history. But for us, we should be most impressed by the simple fact that every day that he was away from his wife, the President of the United States of America took time out from his dealing with the most powerful people in the world to sit down and write a love letter to his wife. I think that says something about the kind of relationship that Harry and Bess Truman had with each other. Such stories restore my faith in the power of love, and the power of relationships that are centered on love, connection, and communication, even in moments of absence. This recent discovery and the story behind it sets the stage perfectly for us this morning as we crack open Paul and Timothy's letter to the Philippians. Because this little book, tucked where it is in the middle of the New Testament, is in fact more than anything else a love letter from two church-planting evangelists 
to a congregation that they had founded and a congregation for which that, from which they were separated. The truth be told, when this letter was written, Paul was in jail. And like Harry Truman, we all know that Paul was very faithful in writing letters to churches when he personally could not go there to visit them. In fact, we have over half of the New Testament because of this practice of St. Paul. And despite his incarceration, where we might expect Paul to be all obsessed and caught up in the struggles of being in jail and going through all the things that he might be going through mentally, physically, and spiritually in jail, in this moment, Paul stops to pen what is perhaps one of the greatest love letters in all of the New Testament. I want you to listen to these adoring words. Paul writes, I thank my God every time I remember you constantly praying with joy in every one of my prayers for all of you because of your sharing in the gospel from the first day until now. Now what we should see in this is that Paul in this particular moment is exalting or lifting up the community in Philippi and he is basically lifting them up in prayer and thanksgiving to God. From the first day, the church at Philippi was one of the earliest communities founded by Paul and so they were kind of like Paul's first love, a community that held a very special place in Paul and Timothy's heart, which makes the letter of the Philippians truly a testament of first love. In his book, Disappointment with God, writer Philip Yancey relates a touching story of first love in his own life. Now, we typically think of first love as being something that happens between boyfriend and girlfriend, right? But in this case, in Yancey's case, the first love of his story is really about his father. One time on a visit to his mother, who had been widowed for many years, and it just happened to be in the month of Yancey's 40th birthday, his mother and he sat down and rummaged through an old box full of photographs and a certain picture stood out to Philip. It was a picture of him at eight months old. He was a baby. The tattered and bent picture, it looked like it had been sort of banged around and he began to wonder to himself, why in the world, Mom, did you actually keep such a battered picture of me when you have so many other pictures of me at that age that are in so much better condition? Yancey writes, My mother explained to me that she had kept the photo as a memento because during my father's illness before his death, when I was only one year old, that picture, that battered up, beaten up picture, had been fastened to my father's iron lung machine. During the last four months of his life, Philip's mother said, Yancey's father lay on his back, completely paralyzed by polio at the age of 24, encased from the neck down in a huge cylindrical breathing unit. With his two young sons banned from the hospital due to the severity of his illness, Philip's father had asked his wife for a picture of his first loves being her and his two sons. Because he was unable to move even his head, those photographs had been jammed between metal knobs 
so that they hung within view of Philip's father. The last four months of Philip Yancey's father's life were spent looking into the faces of his first loves, people that he was prevented from visiting. Yancey writes, I've often thought of that crumpled photograph, for it is one of the few links connecting me to the absent man who was my father. Someone I have no memory of, no sensory knowledge at all, who spent all day, every day, thinking of me, devoting himself to me, and loving me. For the Philippian church and for us in the 21st century, Paul and Timothy's letter to the Philippians is like Yancey's photograph. This little token and reminder of a love that extends beyond the boundaries of human limitation, time, and circumstance reaches out to each and every one of us to say, God loves you. Your Father loves you. Such tokens can be life-giving and restorative. I mean, who doesn't need to be reminded of this to be reminded that you are the beloved, like every day? Who doesn't need to know that someone else is thinking of them and perhaps is even loving them? Who doesn't need to have someone reach across the distance of time to call them back to the ones who first loved them? Is there anybody here this morning that does not need that? I certainly need it. Kathleen Norris is perhaps one of the greatest writers of spiritual literature on the planet. And some years ago, she wrote a book called Dakota. It's a book of meditation and Christian devotion. And because of that one little book, people now know who Kathleen Norris is. But in another writing, Norris talked about her spiritual pilgrimage. She said that she was raised in the church, but during young adulthood, like so many of her peers, she left the church. Arriving at middle age, she returned to the church after an experience that she had at a Benedictine monastery in Minnesota. There she experienced the spiritual discipline of, monastic, of a monastic order that is called Lexio Continuo, which means sitting and listening to the meditative reading of Scripture. Kathleen Norris says, doing this actually changed her life. It was an epiphany when she was listening to the slow meditative reading of the Revelation of John. Now, at the beginning of that book, John addresses seven churches. And he says to the church at Ephesus, God has this against you, that you have abandoned the love that you had at first. Norris wrote, these words of conversion taking hold, they can actually change a life. You have abandoned the love that you had at first. Norris says, when I first heard these words in the monk's choir, tears welled up in me, unexpected and unwelcome. I remember how completely I had loved God and the church as a child, and how easily I had drifted away as a young adult. You have abandoned the love you had at first. In the Benedictine choir, Kathleen Norris allowed holy words of first love to wash over her, and her sense of sacredness in the world returned. And from that moment, she began to hear God's love anew for her and her life. Friends, who doesn't need that? To hear God's love anew. 
Paul and Timothy knew that the Philippians needed to hear it. So Paul writes, and I continue in our reading for today. For God is my witness, says Paul. How I long for all of you with the compassion of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may overflow. Now let me ask you this. Have you ever been confronted with a message that actually changed your life? Well, one church chose as its Lenten theme, 40 Days of Love. Each member of that congregation was encouraged to show their love and appreciation for others in all different kinds of ways. The first week, they were encouraged to send notes to people who had made a positive contribution to their life within the congregation. After the first service, a man in the congregation wanted to, to speak with his pastor. And the pastor described the man as kind of macho, a former football player who was, you know, kind of the type of guy who liked to hunt and fish, a strong, self-made man. This man came up to his pastor and said, you know, I love this church, pastor, but uh, I am not going to participate in this 40 days of love stuff. It's okay for some folks, but it's just a little bit too syrupy for me. Well, a week went by. The next Sunday, this man approached the pastor again. And he said, Pastor, I just want to apologize to you for what I said to you last Sunday about those 40 days of love. I realized on Wednesday that I was wrong. <laughs> on Wednesday, said the pastor. What happened on Wednesday? Well, that's when the letter arrived, Pastor. That's the, when I got that letter. What letter, said the pastor. Well, he said, one of these uh, members of this church wrote me a letter, and I, somebody that I didn't even, did not even expect to hear from, in fact, I did not think that person even liked me at all. In fact, I'm not sure they really cared for me in the least. And every time I read that letter, I get tears in my eyes, pastor, I, those people actually said they loved me. I didn't even know that they knew me, and yet they loved me. And you know what, Pastor? I think now I believe them. They said they loved me. Now, this was a transforming moment in this man's life to suddenly realize that he was loved by other members of his church. Are there any of you sitting here this morning who need that kind of love? To know that the people sitting next to you actually do love you, do care for you, do want the best for you, do want to share Christ's love with you. It completely changed this man's entire life. Laughing, this man finally said, you know, Pastor, I was so moved by that letter, I sat down and I wrote ten of them myself. <laughs> well, as we begin in our journey into Lent, I think it's very fitting that we turn our hearts and minds to the message of the scripture that we receive in Paul and Timothy, Timothy's letter to the Philippians. We may not be the sentimental type normally given to writing and receiving love, love letters and cards like Rachel Price. But as with Mr. Winstick in the story just told, perhaps our hearts can be changed this Lent by the message received in this love letter. Perhaps this Lent we will receive the message of the gospel as a sign and a symbol of our first love, a token of our Father's devoted love, and perhaps with Kathleen Norris, we will be washed anew in the power of the word that calls us back to the love we had at first. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I love you. I really do. And I just wish that you will enjoy a blessed Lent in Christ's name. Amen.